The early 2000s were very cringy. You saying white people can't dance? Say what sparrows? On the sparrows. On the what was sparrows? On the ass sparrows. On the what what? The first time I did that, I almost flashed the camera, so <laughs> wasn't trying to get demonetized out here. Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings, and my fellow aunties, uncles, and pibblings. And some of y'all are saying you're too old to be calling me auntie, which is fair, but also some of y'all think I'm 22. I'm 28, I turned 29 this year. Just was born in 92. Just gonna put that out there. If you are new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I just sit on my floor, talk about whatever I want. Sometimes I talk to my friends and sometimes I do video essays. Today, I want to talk about the seen around the world. Am I gonna get demonetized for saying so much? I'll bleep it out. Today we're gonna talk about the event that resulted in YouTube's creation. Yes, some of y'all didn't know that. We're gonna be talking about the Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake wardrobe malfunction at the 2004 Super Bowl. I'm gonna give y'all a bit of history as to how the Super Bowl halftime show became a thing in the first place. We're gonna talk about the incident from 04, of course, and then we're gonna talk about the media's coverage of it and spend the bulk of this video discussing the Jezebel trope against white masculinity. <sighs> so strap in kids because we are going on a journey. But before we go on that journey, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Audible. So y'all know that I absolutely love to read, but something that you might not know about me is that I'm actually an auditory learner. So I remember things a lot easier and retain information in general better by listening to it. And audiobooks have been so amazing for me this year, especially with the amount of content that I make and the amount of research that I have to do. They have truly saved me so much time. A recent audiobook that I have become obsessed with is Sonia Renee Taylor's The Body Is Not An Apology. She reads it to you and it just feels like you're being embraced but also like told to live in your power and I, I just, we live for it. We live for it. Every month, Audible members get a free audiobook and full access to the Plus catalog, which contains select audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, sleep tracks, and more. You can listen to the thousands of titles that they have available while you cook, while you clean, while you're relaxing, you name it, anytime. Try the 30-day free trial by visiting audible.com slash Khadija, or clicking the link in the description below, or texting Khadija to 500-500 and get started listening. Okay, let's get back to the video. Okay, so in order to talk about how the Super Bowl halftime show has become such a major phenomenon within the culture, we have to talk about how the halftime show even became a thing. See, back in the 1920s, professional football wasn't as popular as collegiate football. And it was for a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons was that there was a lot of dead time between the halves. So enter Walter Lingo. He is the owner of the Oorang Dog Kennels in La Rue, Ohio, and he is described by people as, quote, always looking for the next big publicity stunt. He basically was a man who wanted to promote his business. I mean, he spent two grand a month on advertising alone, which in today's money is like $3 million. <laughs> I'm kidding, that's not the conversion rate. If you watch, any of you that listen to My Favorite Murder know why I said that. Walter Lingo owned these kennels. Celebrities and athletes would come to visit, would go hunting with him. And because he was always looking for the next big thing, he decides one day, maybe a way to advertise my kennels is if I buy a football team, as, as a wealthy person just does. So he recruits Pete Kallick and Bill Thorpe. This man's name is Jim Thorpe, not Bill. Bill is his son. I say Bill Thorpe for the rest of this video and it's supposed to be Jim. I have no clue what was going on there. 
to coach this team, which would be the first and only all Native American football team, and also asked them to be the supervisors for his kennels. Now, Bill Thorpe, in his own right, was a pretty incredible athlete. He was quite popular, but at that time, he was past his prime when it comes to playing. So he took the coaching opportunity. I think they paid something like 500 a week, which in 1920s is probably some pretty good money. So with Walter Lingo owning everything and Pete Kallick and Bill Thorpe supervising this first and ever all Native American football team, it's something like 25 men representing nine different tribes, the Oorang team is born. Now, why all of this matters is because they actually started doing performances before and during the games. So during halftime show, they would bring out the Oorang dogs from these kennels and the players would perform with them in a display that was, quote, reminiscent of the Westminster Dog Show. The players would throw knives and tomahawks, uh, dogs would chase raccoons around, and the final performances of the halftime shows would be the players, the Native American players, doing war reenactments with German soldiers. I want to note that yes, the players and coaches were getting paid. When in history have you seen something like that where an indigenous coach is coaching an all indigenous team and they're doing well, or at least are seen as popular, but part of their popularity was based on playing up stereotypes of cowboys and Indians. They were just basically performing the whole time. So when the other team would get to rest during the halftime, the indigenous players weren't. They had to perform and put on a show. In the article that I read, they talked about how Walter Lingo respected indigenous culture, learning different languages and all of that. But at the end of the day, he was trying to make money and this was a way to do it. And even Bill Thorpe kind of played into those stereotypes about the wild Indian to attract larger crowds. Anyways, years after the Super Bowl halftime show just became a performance where mostly marching bands would perform. And then in the 90s, you had marching bands and celebrities performing. So you had groups like New Kids on the Block, Michael Jackson performed, and there was always a theme for every year. So then we get to the 2004 Super Bowl halftime show. And the theme for that year was choose it or lose it because it was an election year. So they're trying to encourage young people to vote. And CBS thinks, okay, how about we recruit MTV, since we're all under the Viacom family, let's recruit MTV to be in charge of the Super Bowl halftime show so we can reach a younger demographic. So of course, MTV does what it does. And the performances, it wasn't just Janet and Justin that performed at that Super Bowl. What happens is Jessica Simpson comes out first to introduce the show, telling young people that they have the right to choose to party or something like that. Houston, choose to party! P. Diddy performs. I think he was going by P. Diddy at the time. Diddy, whatever you want to call him. He performs, Nelly performs, Kid Rock performs, and those performances are kind of sandwiched between Janet Jackson's performance. So it's the last four minutes of the performance. Janet Jackson is singing her wildly popular Rhythm Nation for the first two minutes. And then Justin Timberlake rises from the stage or something like that and starts singing Rock Your Body. They're following each other around on stage. It's a cute little flirty singers doing that back and forth. They kind of dance with each other a little bit. And then we get to the famous line at the end, which is, I'm gonna have you naked by the end of this song. So Justin says that and then reaches over to her bodice and rips it off, revealing her nipple for nine sixteenths of a second before she covers herself up and the camera pans away. And that is, that's what happened, that's it. So 24 hours after this event, Janet Jackson issued a public apology, which she later said in a 2006 interview with Oprah that she kind of regretted doing that because she wasn't sure what she was apologizing for because it was an accident but that's not how the media saw it. If you look at articles and just the general coverage of this event from that time, you'd be fooled into thinking that this was all Janet Jackson's fault, that she orchestrated this whole thing and that Justin was just some innocent bystander. 
I mean, you had media outlets alluding to the fact that Janet was always this sexually provocative, that she was due to have an album come out soon, so she was just trying to use sex and controversy to sell that album, that Justin reached for the bodice thinking that there was supposed to be red lace underneath it. And when he saw her boob, he too felt hoodwinked, bamboozled. I mean, she was a 37 year old pop icon taking advantage of a young pop star just starting his solo career. She was a sexually voracious black woman using her wiles and prowess to bring a nation to heal and use this innocent young white man to do it. Now, where have we heard that narrative before? Stereotypes, stereotypes in the media, stereotypes. Stereotypes in the media. <laughs> in her 2009 paper, The Offending Breast of Janet Jackson, Shannon L. Holland discusses the media's framing of this narrative of Janet Jackson as the Jezebel, and how this stereotype not only contributes to the commodification of black women's bodies, but how it's also used as a sort of site to produce white male masculinity. Let me explain a bit about what all that means. Firstly, the Jezebel stereotype, like the Mammy or the Mulata, was born out of the blackface minstrelsy tradition. Did a whole video essay about it, card. The difference with the Jezebel though, is that it was used by white people, particularly white men, to say, Look at these wild, animalistic black women in their bodies. Their sexual appetites can never be quelled. This narrative was used as a way to justify white men sexually assaulting black women for their white wives, treating black women horribly, even though their husbands were the ones who were the real voracious animals. I just wanna quickly point out that there were black women who would try and use sex appeal with their masters as a means for survival because they were slaves. So anyway, Holland notes that the Jezebel as a contemporary icon comes out of the popularity of black culture and just its general visibility within the media. She notes that that ends up bringing a quote, new representation of raced and gendered identities that are marketable for black and non-black cultures. And that with the contemporary Jezebel, there really is this duality to her. She's a quote, autonomous, liberated sexual agent, but also a maligned, cunning sexual object. And you can see that tunis play out when it comes to the media's mistreatment of Janet Jackson at that time. For starters, it was all about the boob. The boob damn near had a mind of its own. It also though worked maliciously in a partnership with Janet Jackson to corrupt the audience and try and ruin Justin Timberlake. Like the boob was like its own thing. And that's how the Jezebel is seen. She's less of a person and more of a body, a body that will do anything to feed its sexual appetite, a body without limits. Was that planned? No, that was not planned. <laughs> I was like, what the f is happening? <laughs> Right now. How was the kiss? How was the kiss? I don't know. I was too focused on what the f is going on. A body that will devour anything in its path. Now come here. I'm gonna show you what kissing is all about. Well, going up against something like that, Justin Timberlake didn't stand a chance, did he? In all seriousness though, this idea is damaging, not just because, you know, you shouldn't reduce people to tropes, especially women to tropes saturated in sexual immorality because that just helps rape culture <sighs> do what it does. But this trope is also damaging because as Holland points out, the media used this Jezebel narrative as a means to justify disciplining Janet Jackson and the black female body in general. It's too unruly, it needs to be controlled, it needs to be checked. See why we always try to control black women's hairstyles in the workplace. So the second part of the Jezebel duality is predicated on the belief that while the Jezebel's body has a mind of its own, she is also fully in control as well. She knows what she's doing and that's what makes her so immoral. Holland points out the media's depiction of Janet as this deceptive Jezebel and Justin as this innocent white male and explains that the reason for this is because white masculinity needs this kind of narrative. Everything 
has its opposite in this world, you know, light, dark, sound, silence. But when it comes to people, we don't actually have complete opposites, more so perceived opposition. We know that race isn't a real thing, but the construct of it is as real as your reality. Did I just make your head hurt? <laughs> I've been watching too much CJ the X. <laughs> Time is an illusion, you f What I mean by that is that white masculinity isn't any more real than black femininity, but it needs black femininity. It needs the black female body as a site of, as Holland puts it, other, for white masculinity to exist. In the media's depiction of this event, Janet Jackson was this deviant black woman who used her cunning and sexual nature in conjunction with her unruly black female body to trick Justin into performing this lewd act. Even me saying committing and Justin in the same sentence as me holding him to more accountability than the media did in 2004. Accident or planned? Our never seen Super Bowl footage has the answer. If you were Janet Jackson, you had everybody talking in the country about you, would you release it the next day? Maybe that's why. Janet's flaunted her sexuality time and again. Like you would have thought the boob exposed itself. And coming up, the Janet Super Bowl video. Does she plan to expose herself? The answer is on the way. And according to Holland, of the 200 articles that she examined for this paper, one third of them favored Justin's denial of his involvement in this premeditated act. The media used this Jezebel trope to paint Janet as a sexually deviant black body, othering her and absolving Justin of any responsibility for his participation. I probably got 10% of mm -hmm. the blame. And America's harsher on women, America's unfairly harsh on ethnic people. And now that we know the how of the thing, let's talk a bit more about the why. Guess what, y'all? It was psychological patriarchy all along. <laughs> and I killed Sparky too. That doesn't really fit. <laughs> oh gosh. If you want more information about the term psychological patriarchy, check out my For the Boys video. I talk way more about it, but it basically comes from a writer named Terrence Real, a writer and therapist named Terrence Real. But the quick and dirty of it is that psychological patriarchy is what happens when the patriarchy is so ingrained in our minds that it doesn't actually need to perpetuate itself because we perpetuate it for it. We live in a society that values a certain kind of masculinity from a certain kind of body, and anything that deviates from that needs to be labeled, ridiculed, and scorned into a submissive belief that hegemonic masculinity is the only way. The foundation of this system is power and control and that one up, one down paradigm that Real talks so much about. In the world of boys and men, you're either a winner or a loser, one up or one down, in control or controlled, man enough or a girl. Where in this setup is the capacity for love? So going back to the media slash everyone's desire to feel the need to discipline Janet for this act, you see that need for control playing out in real time. If we don't control her body, sub in their body, black women's bodies, they're gonna control us. And that sounds like I'm being kind of dramatic in the way that I'm thinking about it, but it's less a slippery slope argument and more so a, this is just how people see black women's bodies a lot of the time, subconsciously and consciously, but it's particularly dangerous when it's subconscious because you're not even aware that you're doing this and the media keeps perpetuating this. So it it's almost normalized. You know what I mean? Like seriously, think about it. Not even just with black women's bodies. Let's talk about the way we just demonize sex work or going back to women's bodies, women of color's bodies, the way people were freaking out about WAP. In this society, hegemonic masculinity needs power and control to sustain itself. Young men are told from the time their kids are born essentially into adulthood that they have control and power in covert and overt ways. They're told this in every aspect of their lives, except for their <laughs> More so the ideal that a straight cishet man will do anything for a hot straight cishet girl. So then the question for 
these men becomes how do we how do we fix that how do we counter that if the one thing that we don't think we can be in control of that we've told ourselves and everyone else you know boys will be boys we just get not so when it comes to the the boobs we can't help ourselves how do we control it i know we'll call white women sluts. Black women and Latinas will be sexually voracious, you know, maybe we'll make Latina spicy so that it seems a little bit different. Asian women will be docile. Indigenous women will also still be sexually voracious, which in Canada will justify us not doing anything when a bunch of them go missing and murdered. Indigenous women face a murder rate six times the national average. The UN has censured Canada for its ongoing failure to address the crisis. Yeah. We'll do all of that and that'll fix the control problem because if we tell them that they're all hoes, they're not gonna wanna be hoes. Perfect, balance restored, we're in control again. All right, boys, wrap it up, let's go get a coffee. Going back to the Jezebel, the black ass bottom line is that y'all created these tropes to try and not only reify your white masculinity, but to keep tabs and control over black women's bodies. When Janet Jackson's nipple was exposed, literally at the hands of white masculinity, you use this event to vilify her, just so you could try to keep the black female body in check, even though it was an accident. When Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion were whopping and bopping last summer, you know, y'all had to come out of the woodwork, not just white people, black men too. Slow down, like slow down. Slow okay. Down. And let's have some imagination. Let's have some, you know, some privacy, some intimacy, where he wants to find out as opposed to you telling him. Had to come out of the woodwork to vilify them further because you're like, no, no, what the heck? You can't objectify yourself. We have to objectify you. You can't do that. What, what, what does it mean if you do that? And I know we can have a discussion about how realistic it is for you to reclaim negative objective stereotypes, especially when it comes to being a woman and having sexual stereotypes. And, you know, we can talk about sexual liberation and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to elaborate a little bit more on this point. And I don't even know if I actually made a point, but in just the idea of how can you scream sexual liberation when the male gaze is a part of all of that as well even if you want to deny it men made this so blah 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 blah. i fully understand that thinking and i understand that there's you know to what extent are you truly a liberated sexual person if your ideal of sexual liberation is quote unquote the male gaze but i also think that you can reappropriate things I think that Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B are two women who honestly just don't care what y'all think. At least that's how it comes across to an extent, at least when they're talking about their bodies and wearing as much or as little clothing as they want, talking about sex and all of this stuff. I feel like they just truly don't care. And that's what makes people even more upset in a weird sort of way. It seems like there's this thought where particularly cis straight men can't fathom the idea of a sexually quote unquote liberated woman doing something just for them. And this is what I meant when I was talking about how a lot of people think the world is for them. So many people think that other people exist for them. Patriarchy as a system needs something to be below it so that it can be propped up. People that really believe in, as I said before, hegemonic masculinity really believe that there's only one type and that all the other ones are exist to prop up the other type. The world exists for the cis straight dude and anybody else that isn't in line with that is there for this person's entertainment, for this person's disposal and pleasure and to take advantage of it, all this sort of stuff. Obviously I know not all men think like this and all this stuff, but we're just, we're having a bit of discourse, okay? The fact remains that when masculinity and particularly white masculinity's identity is challenged by black women taking back control of our bodies, y'all can't take it. It doesn't fit into your bottom line and you can't benefit off of that narrative because you didn't create it. So what do you try to do instead? Oppress it. <sighs> Lord, okay, I knew this was gonna be long, but I didn't expect it to be this long, y'all. I, I'm really getting back into <laughs> 
the media studies meets sociology bit that I loved so much as a kid. I'm kidding. <laughs> as a as a university student, so I want to note that one thing that inspired this is not just the Britney documentary and all of these things coming out, but was the You're Wrong About podcast. That is one of my favorite podcasts ever. I've been listening to them for about a year now. I love it so, so much. If you like my channel, you will love that podcast. The first episode I ever listened to of theirs was the wardrobe malfunction. And I got a lot of information that I didn't know about it that I didn't even put in this video, like the fact that CBS's chair leader, whatever, ex-chair leader, Les Moonves's predatory ass, allegedly, is like one of the sole reasons why Janet was blacklisted because Justin Timberlake called him to apologize and was all like, me, me, me. And he was like, okay, Justin, you can go to the Grammys. And then Janet didn't call him to give a personal apology and grovel at his feet. So he just was like, well, fuck her. Fuck her and her blackness. I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure this woman doesn't succeed. Meanwhile, he was being a whole ass predator, allegedly. You're Wrong About also pointed out that it would be six years until they had a non-white performance. And that was a Black Eyed Peas in 2011. Before that, they just had a slew of what I like to call the good old boys. You know, good old boys, American music. Like, I don't know. It's just not stuff that I would listen to, but whatever. There was also a lot of talk about the FCC and how rules for the FCC changed a lot in terms of television because of this event. And you know, the culprits are the, the conservative right, just anyway, listen to the podcast. You'll get a lot of information. It was really great. I'll link the sources below for the stuff that I cited because they were really good sources as well. It wasn't as much for this video. There was also a thing about how she was the most searched person for two years after this event. And like I mentioned before, YouTube was created in part because of this. One of the creators was like, I couldn't find anywhere to watch that, what happened. So he started coding <laughs> the formula for YouTube that night. Like, so, I mean, I guess there, there's a silver lining. Oh, oh no, I don't know. I definitely wanna do more videos like this in the future that are time capsule or retrospectives looking back on events, kind of in a you're wrong about way of the way we misremember them and stuff, but also trying to look at them through a like media studies, sociology lens and just kind of seeing where those intersect and how we can be better because I really do think that it's less so about harping on the past and trying to drudge up old dramas and stuff and more so just about looking to the past to get more information because I think it can be really valuable and important. I think all we have is the past and the present. Nobody, <laughs> nobody knows what the future is. And if you do, sorry, I didn't know you were clairvoyant, but, or maybe that's not clairvoyancy. I do know that Justin has since apologized and I've seen Janet's response to that, focusing less on him and just more so on her fans. I feel like she's very much, she's a Taurus, okay? Her birthday's the day after mine, she's a Taurus. And Justin betrayed her and she said in that interview with Oprah that like, she takes friendship and loyalty very seriously and he just wasn't really being a great friend, you know? He kind of threw her under the bus, I think. She never said that, she's too nice, but I think he did. She still did her thing and now, more than a decade later, people are finally coming to her aid. I mean, people were back then too, but more people now, so <sighs> whatever. Anyway, let me know if you wanna see more videos like this. I have a couple of ideas for some that I wanna do, but I won't obviously do a shit ton of them if y'all are like, I don't really care about this stuff, but I, I don't know, I think it's kinda interesting, so yeah. Thank you so, so much for watching all of this. If you made it all the way to the end, comment and let me know if you remember this event, if you remember talking about it to other people, if you've never heard of this event and you were like, wait, they did what to Janet, you know? And yeah, feed your pets, water your plants, and remember that you can always change your mind because you can. And I will see y'all in the next one. Bye. Type in. What is that? What have you done for? I'm sorry. Okay. Why am I doing this? Like this case. I almost flashed y'all. Hold up. And today I'm talking quite quietly. Oh, wow. How long will this go? <sighs> let's, let's pump up the volume. I have a, I have a eclectic audience and some of y'all are too young for that. No. This sunlight is, look at these lashes. She out here. Ah, why did I say all that? <laughs>
Okay, I need to stop filming. I need to stop filming. Thank you. Thank you.